and welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. Talking about a new book today called Genie's Demise, Abortion on Trial in Victorian Toronto. This is a book that I think does a really good job of weaving together a lot of different subjects. You know, the core story that's being told here is the story of a trial following the death of a young woman in August of 1875. That's Jeannie, the title figure in the book. And she died after she had gone for an abortion. And the trial was of the, the doctor who performed the procedure. And this book does a really good job of seeing how issues associated with abortion and femininity within Victorian era Toronto, this this time where you have the notion of Toronto, the good intersect with larger issues, things like journalism and sensationalism within the coverage of these types of stories. And it's all weaved together really well by Ian Radforth. And the book is presented not so much as a straight academic history, but as a narrative. And, you know, Ian talks about in the episode how he likes mystery novels and and mystery books and tried to bring some of those elements to tell this particular story while being true to the events and highlighting a perhaps understudied area of Canadian history and certainly of Victorian era Toronto. So with that, let's get right to my conversation with Ian Radforth. All right. And Ian Radforth joins us from Toronto. Ian, how are you doing today? I'm just fine. Thanks. Thank you for joining me to talk about Jeannie's demise. As I talked about in the intro, I had the opportunity to go through the book, through some of the page proofs that were sent along. Really interesting, a lot of material to dig into. But let's start with the basic premise of the book because there's so much going on and so much that can be drawn out of the book. I'm curious for you as the person who did the research and who wrote it, what type of story is this and and what type of story were you trying to tell as you were writing the book? Well, I was trying to write a really interesting narrative that might be of uh, uh, catch the attention of a, a fairly wide audience. Uh, you know, I've been writing for other scholars mainly most of my career, but I retired a couple of years ago. And um, I thought in this book, I really want to write for a general audience, make it as accessible as possible, as lively as possible. So I, f- I focused on that and, and writing a, a, a really lively narrative. It, it, it is, I suppose, in the genre of uh, true crime stories. It is a history. There's nothing fictional about it. And uh, it's based on historical evidence, historical research. But it and it focuses on a crime. I, I'm an avid reader of mystery novels, and uh, when I started thinking about writing for a general audience, I thought uh, maybe a mystery story would be of interest. So I went to the um, archives of Ontario here in Toronto, and uh, went to the Department of Justice records, and there they have a large collection of case files created by the Crown prosecutors. Uh, throughout the province and over many decades. And um, almost right away, it was a bit of a miracle of research. Uh, Within two hours of starting this project, I discovered this uh, case file on um, the case that forms the basis of the book, the death of Jeannie, Jeannie Gilmore, and the uh, trial mainly of her abortionists, uh, Arthur and Alice Davis. And I immediately thought when I saw the fat file that it had a lot of interesting evidence and a lot of interesting angles. And I uh, particularly was struck by the um, theme of uh, abortion and murder. You know, um, in Canadian historiography, there's remarkably little written about the social history of abortion in 19th century Canada. Uh, We have some good work on the legal history of abortion in Canada. Constance Backhouse did some wonderful work uh, a few decades ago on that, but almost nothing on 19th century Ontario experiences. 
I think that has to do with the topic, of course. Um, abortion was illegal in 19th century Canada, and um, women uh, had abortions, uh, tried to do, do so as secretly as possible. And generally, they were effective in being secret. And the result is that there are no records of their abortion experiences. There's nothing for the historian to go on at all for the vast majority of abortions. However, in a few cases, exceptional ones, the woman died as a result of the abortion. And that at least sometimes brought in the police, the courts, the press, and they generated evidence that the historian can use. And the case involving Jeannie Gilmore is such a case. Well, I'm really intrigued, though, that there is this lack of material about abortion in Canadian history. And yet you said at the start that you were looking to write this engaging narrative. And I, I'm curious to know if those two things necessarily go together well. You, know, you made reference to mystery novels, and they're really about keeping the audience engaged in almost the whodunit, if, if you were to take the stereotype of a mystery novel. And then you have this, the, the story of abortion, particularly in this Victorian era, where certainly not the same medical standards as you would have in a modern doctor's office. So is there any conflict there between trying to craft that narrative and the harsh reality of abortion in the Victorian era? Well, it's not a pretty subject, that's for sure. It's a very serious one. And Jeannie died a horrible death, a very painful one. Uh, and that's very sad. Uh, but I think the, um, uh, uh, the mysteries were there from the start, and I didn't have to impose anything on the topic. The newspapers, which, of course, sensationalized the case from the start, um, first reported on the discovery of an unknown person's body um, in a pine box cast to the side of the road on, on Bloor Street, just on the edge of Toronto in 1875. And the newspapers wondered, well, who was she? Um, and there was an inquest into her death immediately upon the discovery of the body. And the doctors who conducted the autopsy found that she died as a result of an abortion. And so the press also immediately said, oh, well, how did this woman come to have an abortion? Uh, where would she have gone? After all, this is Toronto the good. It only took about a, a, a day and a half before uh, it was discovered that the body was that of Jane Vaughan Gilmore, a 23-year-old um, immigrant woman from Scotland and um, known as Jeannie to almost everybody, um, and that um, uh, she was the daughter of a Baptist minister. She came from a God-fearing home, the newspaper said, uh, highly respectable character. Um, in general, of course, Scottish immigrants were respectable immigrants in Victorian Toronto. And um, they said, how was it that she could have ended up in the hands of abortionists? Also, almost immediately, it was discovered that uh, who the abortionists were. And uh, Arthur and Alice Davis, a married couple, were um, arrested by police for Jeannie's murder. And it was known that they had a practice right in the center of town, just off King and Young Street's which was uh, absolutely the center of town in 1875. And again, the press said, how could uh, such a practice continue to uh, um, uh, operate right under the nose of virtually everyone uh, here in Toronto? And uh, so the mysteries were there from the, from the start. And I think the, uh, the theme of a, a lively narrative and this sobering tale, um, it, all, it, it all works. So let's get into a little bit about who these people are then. You mentioned a little bit about Jeannie Gilmore's background, Scottish immigrant, young woman. What did take her to get an abortion? And what were the circumstances that, that led her into that office? And is she representative of some of the younger immigrant women in Toronto at the time? Well, Jeannie had been in um, Canada for just a couple of years at the time she died. She arrived in Canada with her family. Her father 
and mother had been agriculturalists in Scotland. And then they'd moved to Edinburgh and her father used that as a base to conduct um, evangelical missions throughout Northern England and Scotland. Jeannie, uh, once she turned 15, worked in a, uh, as a shop assistant in a draper's office, a draper's shop. And um, John Gilmore, her father, decided it, that it uh, uh, would benefit the family to come to Canada. And he chose Ontario uh, because he thought he could get a free land grant from the Ontario government, which he did, and develop uh, a farm uh, that the family could call their own. He also expected to continue with preaching uh, once in Ontario. So Jeannie came over, uh, they arrived in Toronto, and she quickly uh, looked for work. And she was very employable as at that time a 21-year-old Scottish immigrant just off the boat. Um, and she found a job readily um, as a servant in the home of farmers living not far from Toronto. The rest of the family pretty soon started developing the, uh, the bush farm on the free land grant they got in the Parry Sound district that's um, uh, well north of Toronto and at that time north of the really settled area and good agricultural land, uh, an area in the Canadian Shield. And the Ontario government was trying to develop that area and giving away um, lots free. And the family got that and the family became preoccupied with developing a farm there. But uh, Jeannie continued to live apart from them as a servant girl in a couple of different farm households north of Toronto. And then eventually she moved to the city um, and took a job in March 1875 in a home that her father approved of. He didn't like the fact that she didn't want to live with the family, uh, her own family, that she preferred to... Uh, work on her own and have her own income. Uh, he wasn't happy about that. He thought she was too independent. He found her a, a place in Toronto in a home of a, a prosperous family uh, that he thought was suitably religious. The woman was a, an evangelical of long standing, and her husband was a recent convert, born again in Christ. And he thought this would be a good environment for her. And so um, she was placed there to do light duties around the house, but also as a kind of companion to the wife. And um, um, Jeannie's father hoped that the wife, the employer, would uh, teach her uh, the skills of uh, uh, a lady, uh, that she could improve her class position by learning to play the piano and doing fine needlework and so forth. Um, so that's where she was when she... Um, uh, went to the abortion office. Uh, we do not know anything about how she got pregnant. It's unclear whether she was raped or whether she had an affair. Uh, it does look like an affair was possible, but the evidence is very slight and it never came up in any of the court trials um, exactly what had happened to her. But once she discovered to her horror that she was pregnant, and it was about uh, uh, possibly three months in to her pregnancy, she found her way to this abortion uh, practice in the center of city, run, uh, the city run by the Davises. Um, how she learned of their name, I don't know, except they were uh, well-known abortionists. They advertised quite widely uh, about their uh, medical practice. And she may have seen an advertisement or perhaps somebody recommended them. We don't know. Uh, but she went there and she, she began by uh, uh, seeking some kind of abortifacient, some kind of uh, pills she could take or, or, or drops she could take that would bring on her period, as people thought of it at the time, and the obstruction in the way. And she did so, but uh, nothing happened as a result of taking the drugs. And that, that was quite common at the time. The abortifacients by no means always worked. And so she sought a procedure, an abortion, uh, by uh, mechanical means, as it was called by the law. And uh, so-called doctor, Arthur Davis, uh, 
performed that abortion for her. And uh, it was botched. And a couple of days afterwards, uh, the blood poisoning that set in as a result of non-sterile um, conditions when she was operated on uh, resulted in her death. Just how typical she is is very hard to say. I mean, there were uh, many young women, single women, who got pregnant, of course, and were concerned about what to do. Uh, their first recourse was generally to try to get the man to marry them, but uh, um, some men would refuse and some men were married and couldn't uh, uh, remarry um, or marry for a second time. And um, uh, so uh, they um, tried uh, means to get rid of their pregnancy. There were also some married women who at the time were trying to uh, uh, eliminate pregnancies because they already had large families and they didn't want them to grow any larger. And among the middle and upper class, it was fashionable to have smaller families by the late 19th century. And uh, some women didn't want to have a lot of pregnancies uh, because of the fashion of the day. So that's, you know, it's hard to say exactly under what circumstances women ended up in uh, abortion practices, but um, uh, certainly quite a few of them would have. So for the Davises the, who are performing abortions, you mentioned that they were well known for doing abortions and that it's possible that Jeannie had seen an advertisement. And the book talks about coded advertisements in newspapers, which is really interesting to me because at the start you said that people were surprised and newspapers wrote articles or had articles talking about that they were surprised that there was an abortion clinic in Toronto so what type of coded advertisements were used? And in terms of how well known the Davises were, were, was it a specific segment of the population to whom they were well known and it was hidden to perhaps a, a quote unquote mainstream part of Toronto society? No, I don't think their business was hidden at all to anyone who was at all interested they advertised in newspapers, as I say, in, in coded ways, but it didn't take much to break the code. Um, they would offer various services to um, both men and women. Men, they uh, claim to cure impotency and venereal diseases. Uh, women, they would say they would uh, bring on their menses, um, a return to the regular menstrual cycle. Um, and if there were blockages, they could eliminate them. Uh, it was pretty clear what kind of a service was being offered. Uh, and, and it wasn't only in newspapers that they advertised. I came across um, bills for ads that the Davises placed to be included on a steamboat in Toronto in the songbook of the steamboat. Um, so people standing around the piano, enjoying a, a, a trip on the steamer, uh, would sing songs and come across their abortion ad. Other abortionists advertised in places like the Toronto City Directory, you know, open to everyone and, and uh, widely read at the time. Uh, so I don't think there was anything absolutely hidden about their practice. What the newspapers generally did, though, and what respectable people did, what the uh, medical profession and uh, the licensed medical profession, the organized profession did, was pretend that because abortion was illegal and in the eyes of many wrong, morally wrong, religiously wrong, uh, there weren't abortionists around. Abortion was uh, frequently condemned in the press. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, the, the Globe editorial might condemn abortion, but there'd be on the back page a, a newspaper advertisement that the Globe had accepted and, and uh, taken the money to uh, publish. So there was an awful lot of hypocrisy there um, uh, around this topic. Uh, Toronto the Good was an image to be upheld. The law was to be upheld. Um, we were uh, religiously observant, good Christians, um, and yet we looked the other way around uh, this practice. And that may have been because a lot of people saw that it was useful. Um, and people of various classes would have seen uh, abortionists as useful. People like the Davises charged quite a bit of money, so they were really serving um, a reasonably well-to-do population. And... Uh, 
that was another part of the mystery from the start that the press focused on was how could uh, the daughter of a minister who was a part-time servant who made very little money uh, afford an abortion at a place like the Davises. And of course, it was surmised that there must have been a seducer in the background who had actually arranged the abortion and paid for it. But his identity was unknown. So as as the story moves forward, how do we get to the point where this particular case captures the attention of the city in the way that it does? And I'm curious to know how we get to the point of a murder charge. And no one would ever accuse me of being a legal scholar by any means. But in terms of, I think, a popular imagination, or at least my popular imagination of murder, there's this idea of malice behind it and intent behind murder. So how do we get to the point where the Davises are put on this kind of sensationalist trial? I mean, they were they were charged the morning the body was found. Uh, they were charged with murder by Toronto police detectives. It didn't take any length of time to get to that point. Why they were charged with murder is because of the uh, law of the time. If a death occurred during the commission or as a result of the commission of a felony, then the charge had to be murder, whether there was intent or not. Normally, you're quite right, Sean, that that we think of manslaughter as the more likely charge if there's no intent and murder would require intent. But if a felony was uh, involved, uh, then the um, uh, charge had to be murder. And in this case, uh, uh, the felony was abortion. And uh, so the charge was murder. One of the judges explained to a jury, because people were you know, not very clear on this at the time, and, and the lawyers and the judge uh, in the case had to take time to explain it to the jury. They uh, gave the parallel, you know, if somebody was burning down a house for the insurance money and someone happened to die in the house as a result of the fire, then the charge had to be murder because there was a felony involved Uh, the insurance scam, and a death occurred. So it's the same kind of thing. It's It's a peculiar part of the law at the time. And how many cases like this did you find? Because I know that there are similar cases around this point in this Victorian era where there were other fatalities in the midst of abortions. So what are some of the, the parallels that you found to other cases? And, and what is the scale that you found in terms of the comps to Jeannie's experience? I did um, um, look for other cases, um, uh, partly to provide a context and partly because at the beginning of the project, I thought um, Jeannie's story would be one chapter in a book on a number of abortion murder cases. Ultimately, I decided instead to focus on the one case and I thought there was enough material there and that might be more interesting that way to a general audience and um, I think I was right. Uh, But I do have a chapter in the book uh, that looks at 15 other cases that I found uh, where uh, someone was at least um, thought by the Crown to have died as a result of an abortion. And these are cases I found uh, for Ontario in the Ontario records from 1868 to 1908. So in the first 40 years or so after Confederation, just 15 cases. It's, it's not all that many, it seems to me. Um, there were probably scads of abortions, uh, but not many of these abortion murder cases. But they, and they, they do provide a context in the sense that what I mainly discovered was that there was tremendous variety among the cases. Ten of the cases took place in Toronto, but five of them were in rural places, sometimes truly in the countryside in farm homes. Several of the cases, I think it was five, were um, uh, the abortionist was a licensed doctor, but in 10 cases, the abortionist was not. In uh, most of my cases, the abortionists were men, but in uh, two cases, the abortionists were women. Um, Some of the cases, it was very clear that the abortionist was what what I call a professional, relying on the sale of abortion services for an income or a significant part of an income. But in 
most cases, um, they were probably done um, by people on the spur of the moment who weren't really deeply engaged in the business at all. Uh, sometimes done uh, simply to help out somebody you knew who was in a, a bad situation. Women at the core, of course, at the time, particularly sing single women, were horrified to discover they were pregnant because there'd be so much social shaming uh, as a result of uh, uh, becoming pregnant out of wedlock. And with the social shaming often came ostracization from family and neighbors. And uh, that also often meant poverty. And so women who were single and had no hope of getting married after they discovered they were pregnant uh, really were in a dire situation. And some of them at least were willing to risk abortions, which were uh, generally regarded as risky, but maybe maybe worth the risk in the minds of, of many women at the time. And so what, is, what does that tell us then about Victorian Toronto, at least, where these are illegal procedures that, you know, as you mentioned, that it's against the law to have an abortion. And yet there's all these women who are going to have them based on whatever their circumstances are. And yet at the same time, there, there seems to me as an outsider to this and, and just reading about it, there seems to be some, again, conflict in the way that people are looking the other way to it unless something bad happens, like in, in Jeannie's case, while at the same time trying to maintain some sort of morality, this Victorian ideal of, as you mentioned, Toronto, the good. So how do we try to come to terms with what, in my head, seems to be conflicting ideals of what's happening in the city during this time? I mean, respectable people held to the ideal on a certain level that they thought it would be best if only married women um, ever got pregnant and married women who could afford to uh, care for their children well and so forth. That was the ideal. Um, they hoped that young women who were single wouldn't have sex before marriage and wouldn't get pregnant. But that's not what always happened, of course. Um, and the reality was something, uh, in their eyes, less than the ideal. And what you do in a crisis then is um, try to find solutions so that shame is not brought upon the family. In Jeannie's case, we have a little bit of evidence um, uh, that she was very concerned about what her father thought. Um, he being a Baptist minister, very uh, upright, stern, and um, she was just so mortified to think that she'd have to admit to him that she had had some kind of sex before marriage and that she was about to have a baby. And uh, in order to avoid doing that, she took on the risk, which she knew was a risk, of, of having an abortion. Um, and probably her chances were that she would have survived and uh, nobody would have known about her abortion uh, afterwards and she could have lived her life for many years. But things were botched in her case. Arthur Davis, who's a bit of a character, I haven't said much about him yet here, but he's a, a man who grew up in the abortion business. His father was an abortionist in Toronto and sometimes in Buffalo. And uh, he learned the trade from him and worked alongside him as a young man. And at, at, at just about, uh, I think it was 21 years of age, he came to Toronto and set up his own abortion practice, which was uh, not just an abortion practice. Um, as I said, he also treated men for impotency and venereal disease and so forth. But he also was, uh, had brushes with the law from a young age. At 17, he was arrested for housebreaking, on a number of occasions uh, later, he was involved in scams, including a bank robbery, uh, and he went to court over these things. So we have some records of these crisis moments in his life. We also know that um, sometimes he escaped Toronto because he thought the uh, cops were after him because of an abortion case that they became aware of. Uh, and he'd go to Rochester, and where he opened a practice. And uh, there he got in 
involved with the law around abortions again, especially when a couple of women died as a result of abortions, allegedly at least. And so he would hop across the border to Toronto, not far away, and continue his business here. Um, you know, he was, he was a bit of a scam artist. He was also a drunk. Uh, he drank very heavily, spent a lot of time in the whiskey shops of central Toronto, um, and um, was unable to conduct his business with any efficiency at those times. He had married um, a couple of years before and Jeannie died. He married uh, a young woman um, that he met, um, and she came from a farm uh, background in the Rochester area. She'd lived a very quiet life as a farmer's daughter and had attended Baptist Sunday school. She was um, a very nice, respectable girl. Uh, I think she was drawn to him. He was about 10 years older than she was, and, and he was a professional. She always called him the doctor, although he was unlicensed and his medical practice was far from respectable. Um, she was intrigued by it. And, and when they married, she moved up to Toronto to be with him and to work in his medical practice. She strikes me as an amazingly resourceful and adaptive woman. Here's a, a, a young woman from a, a farm background who moves to the city and right to the heart of the city, who's never done office work or medical work, and she's thrown into this practice. And she kind of takes over a lot of the work because her husband, Arthur, was drunk so often. So she was the one who uh, spent time at the office and met patients who came there seeking advice or seeking drugs. And she was also the one who managed cases where there was a procedure. Um, uh, she would look after the convalescence of the women in uh, the Davis's home. Uh, so she did an awful lot of work. Uh, uh, Arthur Davis was um, uh, quite in love with her, I think, and as she was with him. And uh, he called her at one point a brick. And uh, he really did uh, rely on her. And uh, so, you know, they're, they're a quite an interesting couple in their own right. And the story continues later. I don't want to give it away because I do think of it still as a bit of a mystery story, uh, what happens later on. But there's much more evidence of her resourcefulness uh, uh, later in the book. Of course, yeah, we don't definitely don't want to give anything away in the book. But for the two of them and the attention that they drew during this case was this something that they expected to happen no, obviously they they're, they're not out for genie to die but did they expect to be the center of attention in the city after this happens and just from their personalities described it how did they handle that well sure i think they expected they'd be a, uh, the center of attention um, and that's why they behaved as they did when Jeannie died. Um, they tried to hide their crime. After a day or two uh, with her body rotting in an upstairs room, uh, they decided to hire a carpenter to build them a, a coffin-like box. And they hoped to you know, uh, get rid of her body. And they took steps to do so. Uh, that's why the body was dumped on Bloor Street out on the edge of town. Uh, they hoped that uh, their crime would um, not be discovered and that uh, um, they'd get away with it. But uh, that was far from the case. It turned out that uh, there had been many eyes on the street the night they were transporting the body or the body was transported from their home. There was a night watchman who watched them uh, take the coffin-like box, a heavy box, uh, out of the house and place it in a wagon there were other night watchmen who saw the wagon going through the streets. There were residents of town who recognized Davis. He had a bright red beard, long red beard, and kind of stood out. Um, so they knew what he'd been up to, trying to actually hire a wagon and hire a horse and so forth for this job, hire a carpenter. Lots of people knew what he were do was had been doing, and they looked guilty right from the start. So. Almost as soon as the, the body was discovered first thing on a Sunday morning, and it was you know, only a, two or three hours later that the Davises were arrested at their home by uh, Toronto detectives. So they, you know, they knew what they were in for if they were 
caught. They hoped they wouldn't get caught, but they were pretty clumsy in covering up their crime. Uh, they didn't even take the t trouble to bury the box properly. Uh, they, they dumped it uh, in a hurry and, and got away, hoping that maybe it wouldn't be discovered for a while and no connection would be made to them. But that was absolutely not what happened. A lot of people in Toronto were who uh, I've told the story to are, are interested by the fact that uh, to conceal the body, they took it out to the countryside, which was Bloor Street. Um, yeah. Hardly in the countryside any longer, if you know Toronto. And they uh, hoped to bury it in um, the sand pits, as they called them, on Bloor Street, which we now think of as Christie Pits. Um, and there's a subway station called Christie right at the Christie Pits. Uh, I mean, it feels very much like downtown Toronto, where they uh, tried to dispense with the body. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I spent a couple of summers working at the corner of Bay and Bloor, which I know Bay is a little more central. But yeah, Bloor Street, come on, uh, as the outskirts. It, it is hard to, to <laughs> think of it in that way. Yeah. But w for anyone who's going to come to this book, w obviously, again, as, as we said, we don't want to give too much away because there is that mystery element to it. But what is the legacy of Jeannie's case? And what are some of the lessons that we can take perhaps in 2020 in reading about it? And why should people continue to be interested in her story? Well, I think there, um, there are a few takeaways. Um, I think probably the most important one is the fact that the, the story, the tragedy reminds us of uh, just how dangerous the plight of women, particularly single women who found themselves pregnant, was in an era when abortion was illegal, when it was criminalized. Women had very few options uh, in these moments of crisis, and abortion was uh, very far from an attractive option, a highly dangerous one. Uh, but some women were willing to take the risk because they were so desperate. And I think, of course, there's a lesson there for today, as we see, for instance, in the United States, in Poland this week, um, abortion rights being uh, rolled back. Why this case is a reminder of how dangerous things can get when abortion is criminalized. Fortunately, in Canada today, of course, abortion is not criminal. Um, the abortion rights movement um, had a big impact on the law um, beginning in uh, the late 60s. And um, women do have uh, the right to choose in Canada. They don't always have good access to abortion today, of course, and that struggle continues here in Canada too. So the dangers of abortion when it's criminalized, that's a big thing for me. I think also the book tries to say something about the atmosphere of Toronto in the late 19th century, even though Toronto was the biggest city in the province, the capital, uh, an industrial and commercial center, it's amazing to me just how many uh, people were aware, very aware of who was around them, what was going on around them. And so many people came to testify in the court cases about what they'd seen. Uh, even if they didn't know Davis, they knew this man with this reputation and this red beard and they'd seen him in the streets and could say just where he'd been that particular uh, time. It was quite an intimate world, at least in the center of town uh, back in the 1870s. Um, certainly uh, the well-connected folks uh, all knew one another and, uh, you know, the lawyers were used to working with another, one another. The judges all knew the lawyers well and so forth. It was an intimate uh, world um, for um, those uh, with power. But for more than that, I think, for, for more people than that. And then... I think we've talked about it already, but I think underlining the, the hypocrisy of Toronto the good is, is something I want people to come away with, a sense of that there could be this uh, uh, kind of game played where uh, officials and public commentators condemned abortion and in very forceful ways, and yet uh, so many people look the other way and did not take steps to uh, suppress abortionists who were known to be active in town. 
it, it, it's an interesting uh, um, theme that I don't think has come out uh, so clearly in other studies. Interesting story, to be sure. So the, again, the title is Genie's Demise, Abortion on Trial in Victorian Toronto. Ian, where can people find the book and find more information about you and your work? Well, the book's published by Between the Lines, BTL Books. And um, if you go to their website, um, you or, or just put uh, Radforth Genie's Demise in your browser, you'll get to their website and the book can be ordered from the press now. It was just released on Monday, and but they're uh, in position to send out copies now. I did check, at least yesterday, Amazon was still saying it was on order, but um, it will have Genie's Demise soon too, I'm sure. Yes, and uh, it's always, uh, or it has been an interesting process over the past few months for people bringing books to the market, uh, having them released in this time. So hopefully people will come to it, find it. I really enjoyed it. Very interesting story. And, and as you said at the start, it's obviously a, a real life crime story, uh, but it has that strong narrative. So I, I think people will enjoy it if they go to it. So we certainly encourage everybody to do that. So Ian Radford, thank you so much for your time today. Okay, my pleasure. So there you have it. My conversation with Ian Radforth, again, the book, Jeannie's Demise, Abortion on Trial in Victorian Toronto, available from our friends at BTP Books. And I thank them for helping to set everything up for today. So that'll do it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever it is you get your podcast on Google or Apple. Give us the likes, the ratings, do some comments, helps us beat the algorithm and uh, helps other people find the show, keeps us going. Also head on over to activehistory.ca. Some great material over there for the past few weeks. So I would encourage everybody to check it out. And you can also find all of our past episodes on the podcast section of activehistory.ca. As we continue to chug along during this pandemic era of episodes, We'll be back next week with another new show. But of course, if you want to let me know what you want to hear on the episode, you can get in touch history slam at gmail.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the Sean Graham. So we will talk to you again next week. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.